Hello, and uh, welcome to another episode of the Early Modern Warfare Podcast. Uh, today we'll be going back to the Italian Wars and uh, looking at Louis XII's invasion of Naples from about 1501 to 1504. Uh, this was seen by uh, many in Europe as kind of foolish because it would provoke a Spanish response as uh, he... Uh, King Ferdinand of Spain and Louis XII had concluded an agreement over Naples, um, but both sides saw this as kind of a temporary agreement. Uh, but by June of 1501, uh, Louis had mobilized an army under the command of his general D'Aubigny, who set out for Naples with about a thousand, the city of Naples, I should say, with about a thousand lancers, 7,000 mostly French infantry, and 36 large cannon. And uh, Cesare Borgia was also part of this expedition. Uh, the king of Naples, Frederigo, uh, failed to get his nobles to levy him any men. And as we'll see uh, going forward in the series, and as we have seen uh, in previous episodes, this is a pretty common problem for early modern monarchs. They always have to get the, na the nobles on board. And it doesn't. All it often doesn't really work even in the face of uh, an existential danger. So the two lords he was able to recruit, Prospero Colonna and his brother Fabrizio, reinforced the city of Capua, and uh, it was there French forces dueled with the uh, city's bastions artillery. Uh, but once these bastions were destroyed by the French defenders, uh, by the French, excuse me, and the defenders in them were slaughtered, they blew through the city walls, and the sack of Capua that ensued uh, is reported to be one of the most horrific incidents of the entire war. Um, you know, I'm sure there was looting, killing civilians, that sort of thing. Uh, and what this did do, however, is it sent a message to Naples, which paid uh, a 60,000 ducat settlement to the French, and that was in late July 1501. So fairly quickly... The French are able to smash through these defenses, capture the capital city. Uh, and as we can see, there's a lot of uh, signs of things to come. Uh, you have a positional warfare, and again, like we discussed in our previous Italian Wars installment, uh, the everyone is, is ostensibly a target by these soldiers. It's, there's not a lot of limitations Whereas uh, in the medieval world, there was a lot more regulation of warfare. Uh, and that was mostly because in the medieval period, you're dealing with much smaller scale f uh, forces. Um, but even by this time, the early, the dawn of the 16th century, you have quite large armies. And especially given the uh, restricted space, when you think about Italy, th these are fairly substantial forces. And now we enter into Spain's involvement in this war and uh, the rest of this particular conflict uh, of the Italian Wars is a French and Spanish competition. So they, uh, uh, the Spanish had already sent troops to Naples and that was in July of 1500, but it was a relatively small garrison, about 150 men-at-arms. And uh, the men-at-arms, just as an aside, were uh, sort of like dismounted knights. So... Um, usually wearing plate armor, carrying uh, hand weapons, swords and shields, that sort of thing. Uh, they also had 300 light cavalry and uh, 4,000 regular infantrymen. Later supplemented this garrison uh, that landed in Calabria, and they were led by Gonzalo de Cordoba. Uh, and he blockaded uh, Toronto, the city of Toronto, to prevent a French encroachment on the Spanish uh, sector of the Kingdom of Naples. Uh, but Toronto did not capitulate until 1502, a few years later. Uh, and in the same uh, way as in Milan, uh, Louis XII was primarily concerned in Naples with uh, handing out estates and giving titles to his allies in France uh, to the Kingdom of Naples. The uh, existing Neapolitan nobility were not really happy with either regime. Um, however, 
uh, militarily, they really weren't a major uh, element in this war. So uh, the Spanish are going to be the main offensive army against the French. All right, so uh, Gonzalo de Cordoba is given orders to avoid the French initially. Uh, the idea was just to back Spanish claims to their part of the Kingdom of Naples, essentially. Um, but fairly quickly, you get Spanish skirmishing, Spanish troops skirmishing with French troops. Uh, and eventually, in mid-August of 1502, the French attack and besiege uh, Canosa di Puglia in southern Italy. Uh, the garrison captain, by the name of Pedro Navarro, uh, repulses a lot of the French assaults, uh, but ultimately they have to surrender and uh, are let go because of their bravery. Uh, French, the French general, by the name of Namor, tries to provoke battle with Cordoba, uh, but uh, he's not very successful at first, because Cordoba's trying to delay and avoid the French forces. He's outnumbered, um, so he really uses space to his advantage here. Uh, Cordoba doesn't want to engage, kind of delays, does a delaying tactic. And uh, in the fall of 1502, uh, the, the, the people tended to support the French, uh, according to Venetian uh, reports. Uh, Cordoba, even though he's initially outnumbered, though, gets reinforcements in the fall and winter of that year. And at uh, the Second Battle of Seminara, the French, under uh, De Albigny, defeat the Spanish. However, they're not completely taken out of the fight. Uh, Spain still has uh, strong garrisons in Apulia, and they keep reinforcing themselves with men and grain, uh, primarily from Sicily, using Sicily as a base of operations to ferry men and material. So, from mid, so in mid-February of 1503, uh, Cordoba sorties, sortied out of uh, Barletta, and captured uh, Ruvo, along with uh, the French garrison there, of about 800 men and 150 men-at-arms. And later in April, the Spanish and the French again face off at Seminara. This is the third battle of Seminara. So the Spanish uh, men-at-arms, light horse, and infantry uh, broke the French men-at-arms and their Swiss uh, mercenaries. Cavalry attacks by the Spanish pinned the French flanks. Uh, they used throwing javelins primarily for that, the cavalry, and new lanceneck pikemen that the Spanish had hired, the lanceneck being sort of the German take on the Swiss pikemen, uh, was another advantage that they had, and that allowed them to fight on even footing with the French uh, Swiss mercenaries. And so that evens the odds and sets the stage for the Battle of Cernola in on April 28th, so Cordoba arrives at Chernola f first, uh, and he tells his men to dig into this uh, boundary ditch and put up a berm of dirt, uh, earthworks, and he deploys his lanzknechts in the center and has them covered by uh, arquebusiers, mu musketeers essentially. At 300 men-at-arms are deployed on the left and also covered by hand gunners. And on the right, another there's another block of arquebusiers, hand gunners, same thing. And and then on the further flank on the right, they have uh, the Spanish light horse is deployed. Uh, Nemour arrived in the evening, and his army was pretty tired from marching that day, but he commits them to an attack. Uh, so he throws his men at arms and light horse in the center. Uh, the horses are pretty easily blocked by the earthworks, and the lanceneck pikemen pin the French uh, first wave in place while the musketeers sh uh, shot them down. And the Swiss advance fairly quickly, but uh, they're also impeded by the earthworks. And the Spanish men-at-arms then assaulted the French flanks, and then uh, Cordoba commits the reserve Spanish infantry, and that really 
decisively defeats the French in this engagement. Uh, and the whole battle took place over the course of less than an hour. Uh, Nemour himself had been shot and killed by a musket. And Cordoba gains a reputation, uh, or adds to his reputation, I should say, from this engagement. Um, so by May, the tide was turning in Spain's favor. Uh, Cordoba could enter Naples, and the French began evacuating a lot of their garrisons. And Louis XII was enraged by this and commits more troops and ships to Italy, uh, estimated initially at, at over 10,000. However, a lot fewer men deployed to Naples in total. Uh, it was seen as a sort of lost cause in some ways, and uh, Swiss recruitment was also delayed. So in Rome, the French army was about only 6,000, and they had to stay there uh, because the papacy needed protection, the city of Rome needed protection, until uh, the, the papal conclave could be sorted out. Um, in August, Pope Alexander VI, that Borgia Pope we've talked about before, died, and Pius III was elected as his successor. And once that uh, papal election was completed, the French were finally allowed to leave in late September. Uh, Cordoba had to counter a siege at Gaeta, and the French army was advancing south under the command of Francesco Gonzaga, but they were forced to march by the sea as the uh, overland route was blocked by fortresses. Cordoba positioned himself bes behind the river Gargliano, and the French tried to construct a pontoon bridge, but they were unable to cross, ultimately. Uh, eventually, heavy rains uh, inundated both camps on either side of the river. Uh, Cordoba did not want to retreat to the higher ground, even though it would keep his army dry and uh, kept would keep them from getting sick, uh, but that would have given the French the ability to cross the river. Uh, and this ultimately worked in Cordoba's favor. It was a fairly risky move, but he was able to get the the French army weakened uh, while he could keep bringing in reinforcements from Spain. And by November, uh, the Spanish captain built his own pontoon bridge upstream from the French a few miles. And on the night of December 28th, he crosses it and outflanks the French position and takes them by surprise which allows him to then turn his attention to Gaeta and uh, capture it. Louis XII, back in France, is uh, understandably furious with his commanders, uh, and Cordoba wins a major victory for Spain. Uh, so, as we can see in this uh, campaign of the Italian Wars, uh, Cordoba, he's initially outnumbered, um, but he really uses the space space and time to his advantage. Uh, he he's also outmaneuvers the French army pretty well uh, in a grand tactical sense. And most importantly, probably, in terms of the overall uh, trajectory of warfare in this period, he is able to coordinate the musketeers, the pikemen, and his uh, other elements and use that combined arms tactics. And another uh, advantage he has at this point is uh, fortifications hadn't yet taken on the uh, dominant role they would play later in the century. Uh, so Cordoba and the French, too, are still able to maneuver um, in, a, in a strategic sense. That's still very important. And battle uh, battles are still tactically and strategically important. But as we'll see as the series goes on, uh, the fort fortifications become more and more the focal point and warfare transitions away from um, being based on uh, engagements, field engagements, pitched battle, and is more positional. Uh, you know, capturing certain positions becomes important 
Uh, not that it's not important here in in uh, Italy at this time, but it's it becomes more dom the positional warfare becomes more and more dominant. And so in the next episode, uh, we'll see that uh, this does not end the Italian wars, and France uh, actually ends up becoming much stronger in Italy, because as we'll see what happens is that these different small Italian states, um, and if you hadn't watched the first part of the series, I give a brief overview of most of them, uh, they start to play uh, play France off of each other, off of themselves, essentially. You know, one will ally with France in order to get what it wants, and then another will do it. And so it becomes kind of a vicious cycle. So France uh, is still the strongest in Italy, despite this um, victory by the Spanish in Naples. And the conflict will start to widen as well, because you have uh, King Ferdinand in Spain and the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian are increasingly going to be drawn into Italy. And then... Soon we'll also have the election of Pope Julius II, who would uh, later lead a coalition to push the French out of Italy. Uh, but and, and on top of all this, uh, Louis XII is going to organize a anti-Venetian coalition, the League of Cambrai, uh, to uh, act against Venice. So uh, that's what's coming up, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. And uh, if you have any feedback, please leave it in the comments. Thank you.